Welcome to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Bill Sharp, President of Sharp Research and Translation. Our show today, Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party Fights Back. And to join us, we have a special guest joining us from New York City, uh, Mr. Sean King, who's Senior Vice President of Park International. Before joining uh, Park International, uh, I'm sorry, Park Strategies, I misspoke. Um, Mr. King was a senior advisor on Asian affairs at the Department of Commerce. He also worked with former New York uh, Senator uh, Alfonso de Amato on Capitol Hill. Welcome, Sean. Great to be here. Thank you, Bill. Great. Well, we really have quite a lot to talk about today. Um, the big, the big um, news is the, um, the drubbing that the uh, Nationalist Party, the KMT, uh, uh, suffered last weekend uh, in the 9-1 election in Taiwan. Uh, Sean happens to spend a lot of time in Taiwan. His company has a branch office there. And uh, what's your take on that election? Uh, it was a pretty monstrative uh, victory for the DPP, wasn't it? Yeah, it reminds me of sort of the uh, losses that Republicans took in the U.S. 2006 midterm elections when George Bush the day after said, we got a thumping. Well, the, KMT, the KMT sure got a thumping. And everybody expected it to be uh, pretty big, but not as big as it was. And I think people have grown disenchanted with Ma, sort of his bungling, detached, aloof style. Uh, you know, sort of middle of the road, but nothing great economic growth. Uh, and some also some scandals at the local level with food and other things. But really, uh, I think underlying it all is voters' unease or distrust of this government's continued opening to mainland China and increasing dependence on mainland China, which, you know, at the end of the day is still a sworn enemy of Taiwan. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think uh, oftentimes we forget that. Uh, in this country, uh, and, and it seems to people in Taiwan, if I, uh, if I you know, say so myself, are just a little bit too uh, enthusiastic about making money from China. Right. Um, you know, now, it's interesting. I, I followed this election pretty closely you know, and uh, the lead up to it over the last couple of years. And at first it was called the seven and one, and then they expanded it to the nine and one. And for the, the, the benefit of our viewers, essentially there were 11,130 positions at the local level in Taiwan that were up for, um, for election. 11,130. Uh, there were something like 20,000 candidates for these positions. It, I guess the first impression I get is, you know, this really, an election of this sort, of this magnitude, I think is really an expression of Taiwan's uh, p growing um, political and democratic maturity. Yeah, it really is. And uh, all this done at the barrel of a gun from mainland China across the strait. You know, it's uh, one thing to do democracy in your own time, in your own way, but to do it with such a big hostile neighbor right next door is really a testament to the people of Taiwan. And we've seen it go now in both directions because initially the KMT won the first direct presidential election in 1996, then the DPP won in 2000, 2004, that would be the opposition party sometimes, uh, casually referred to as the Greens, the DPP being blue, mm -hmm. and then the KMT took it back in 2008, in 2012, and now if the trend continues, uh, we face the real possibility that it will go back to the DPP in January 2016 when we have the presidential election and uh, Chairwoman Tsai Ing-wen of the DPP is most likely to be the DPP presidential candidate. So we will have seen the Democratic pendulum go back and forth from blue to green, back to blue, and now maybe back to green. So with all these candidates and, uh, you know, this peaceful transfer of power never, now several times in each direction, it really is a testament to Taiwan and its people. Is it my, my Yankee instincts and my Yankee inclinations that, hey, this is great, this is a viable two-party system uh, where, the party, where the power is shifted back and forth between both of the uh, major parties? Well, seeing as I'm sitting in New York, I have trouble thinking of anybody in Hawaii as a Yankee. But, uh, <laughs> I, I think I know. And I, am, I am a Mets fan, for the record, so I, I don't like the Yankees, but uh, uh -oh. the regional thing. But uh, for the record, yeah, I, I really do think so. I 
think we have a viable, you could say for a while there, there was a four-party system in Taiwan mm. in the 2000s when you had KMT and DPP in the middle, as it were, and then on the far left or the far green, you had the Taiwan Solidarity Union led by former Taiwan President Li Dongwei, and then you also had the People's First Party, James Sung, who was a breakaway, deep blue uh, contingent of the KMT. It was actually James Sung who broke away in 2000 from the Anzan that made it possible for Chen Shui to be, in, to be elected president in right. 2000 when there was a three-way split. Right. And if I may, you know, sure. Chen was elected mayor of Taipei in 1994 also because the blue vote was split. Those are so, really good points. Those are really, really yeah, good points. So that is why I don't think people understand how important it is that Taipei elected a non-blue, non-KMT mayor. Uh, now, that Mr. Ko, the victor, was independent, but he was, for all intents and purposes, a green DPP candidate. Mm. It's just that the green label is so bad in Taipei, they didn't want to give him it. But for the KMT to lose straight up against a non-blue candidate, really, as I said in the LA in uh, Bloomberg the other day, is really like Republicans losing Texas. Uh, it really is a, a seismic upset. I, I should mention uh, again for the benefit of our audience, our guest today is um, often a guest on uh, various uh, TV commentary shows, uh, CNBC, for example, and is often quoted in such publications as the LA Times, Christian Science Monitor, and other, other leading uh, journals. Well, you know, what I've been sitting here and trying to think about the uh, last few days, ever since the election, is, you know, when this election started out, in a way, it wasn't exciting. And, and, and there seems to be various folks report that, um, you know, the level of popular interest in Taiwan didn't seem to be all that high. And there didn't seem to be any sort of, uh, especially in the Taipei race, what you might call core urban issues, like who's going to pick up the trash kind of thing, right? The um, trash is a very serious issue in Taipei with the trucks coming around with the little music. So right. I really know all about the Taipei trash collection. So. And if any one issue seemed to bubble up, it was food safety. You know, that seemed to be across the island, that seemed to be popping up, in, whether it was, you know, the south or the north or wherever. And then it seems that a lot of the commentary now is suggesting that really the, the big push was China policy, that Taiwan was becoming too dependent on China. But then other commentators suggest, well, really, it was, you know, people was, were, were kind of fed up with both parties, actually, but were willing to take a chance on the DPP. And actually, if you look at um, you know, some of the Taiwan magazines, and as they evaluate you know, leaders at the subnational level, it, the top three or top four are DPP letters, uh, leaders, Chen Zhu in Kaohsiung, William Lai in Tainan, uh, and, and a couple of other, um, you know, um, mayors and, 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 and magistrates. And, and so it seems in like, you know, the DPP had the argument for governance. Well, we can govern better than these other folks. Uh, and then Ko seemed to play on this, you know, with his new style of campaigning. He wasn't wearing a necktie. He had very, you know, a very small amount of donations. He was really saying, we want transparency, openness. And, and so I'm not sure what was really the overriding cause of such a drubbing. Do you come back to the China factor? Yes and no, but at a very local level. And I just want to touch on a few things you mentioned. The food scandals were important and jarring to Taiwan in that those are things that we usually associate with the mainland. Mm -hmm. Those are things that happen in big bad China. Uh, you know, <laughs> dumplings showing up in Japanese <laughs> restaurants with cardboard and metal inside from Shandong or something. Right. So for that to happen in Taiwan and for major corporations, uh, you know, to be to knowingly do this, I think that shook a lot of people. Then you also had the gas pipe explosion in Kaohsiung mm -hmm. this year. Right. There was a sense that 
maybe Taiwan wasn't as advanced as people thought compared to other markets in Asia. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, Mr. Ko in Taipei, he struck the perfect note, a doctor, uh, you know, someone you can trust with your life, very clinical, very clean. And I agree that the election started out unexciting. I would say it was almost even worse. I, I thought the elections were almost forgotten before they started. I, I didn't that know if everybody understood how yeah. the elections were going to work. Uh, the fact that it was all happening at once so close to the presidential election, only 14 months away. I thought at some point these elections would be an afterthought or a speed bump. I think China policy was the underlying thing, but what I think really triggered it, the true awakening, would have been in September 2013, and that is when uh, a guy who defies all political descriptions, Wang Jingping, the wiliest of political operators on Taiwan. He's a native Taiwanese, but a member of, a lifelong member of the Kuomintang Blue Party that claims its historical lineage to mainland China. He is the legislative speaker, and Taiwan has a unicameral legislator, legislature that's in the, elected independently of the president, and he is the speaker. So he is a very, if used properly, he can be a very effective bridge to parts of Taiwan that don't necessarily uh, like the KMT because he is a native Taiwanese. So he could speak to a lot of people in the middle, swing voters, swing legislators in the center and the south of the island. And he had very good relations with uh, people in the DPP, even though he's KMT. In fact, he had good relations with everybody because he just gets things done for people. He reminds me of an old Boston-style politician who you go to when you need a, when you need a favor done discreetly. Well, Ma decided to go to war with him, and he lost because he was not pushing the... First of all, we had ECFA, which is the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement right. in 2010, which formed effectively a free trade agreement in certain areas between Taiwan and the mainland, right. primarily in goods. So now they wanted to take it to the next level and do it for services. But uh, the legislature was not moving as fast as Ma wanted, and he felt that Wang Jingping was not pushing it as fast as he could have. So he decided to uh, void his KMT party membership because Wang's seat is not directly elected. It's on a party list, a proportional representation. Right. And so he tried to get rid of him through voiding his party membership. And it was a real abuse of separation of powers that you could have a president doing this to a speaker. But the thing is, is that Ma, after he became president, he became also KMT chairman. And I think that was the kiss of death because Taiwan is a direct elect system. It's not a parliamentary democracy. A sitting president should not also be chairman of the party. It would be like Barack Obama suddenly heading the Democratic National Committee when he's still in the White House. It's a real conflict of interest. So there you have a directly freely elected president also in charge of the party, avoiding the party membership to get his own party speaker out of the way so he could ram through this China services bill against many people's wishes. And, that, and of course, uh, Wang won on appeal. He was he stayed in his position. He's more popular and more powerful than ever. And he stood down Ma because his party and the people he helps and gets favors for know that Ma's going away next year and that Wang's going to be there forever and he'll be there to help them. Just and hold that, that, hold that thought a second, Sean. Uh, just hold that thought. Uh, we need to take a break here, and we'll come back, and we'll talk a little more about Wang Jinping, because I, I totally agree with you. He is a really interesting figure in Taiwan and, and has friends everywhere, whereas Ma doesn't have many friends. Right. So, Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I'm the host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about why people should like science, why science is actually fun, how science is a dynamic and vital part of everyone's life, why everyone, every man, woman, and child on the planet should really know science, should love science, should be familiar with science. So it's a great show. People come on here and have interesting conversations with us. They tell us why they do what they do, why they love it, why we should love it too. I hope you'll join us every Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. And, of course, you can see it anytime on YouTube. Aloha. We're back on the air. Our guest today is uh, Mr. Sean King speaking to us from uh, New York City. He is a senior vice president of Park Strategies. 
Uh, we were, before the break, we were talking about Wang Jinping, one of the most dynamic uh, figures in Taiwan politics. Um, a, a politician who has friends everywhere, uh, throughout the country, on both sides of the aisle, in the VU, in the green camps. Um, do, do you want to pick it up for where you left off there, Sean? Well, his mom couldn't get rid of him the way he wanted, and then uh, in March, they brought the trade services bill with China to a vote in the LY, or at least up for debate and discussion. And the KMT had promised that there would be an article by article reading of the bill, and at the last minute, they decided to just ram it through an up or down vote. And students stormed the legislature and occupied it, sort of a preview of what we've seen in Hong Kong the last few months. Mm. And the bill has stalled, like just pretty much everything else since Ma tried to get rid of Wong, it was unsuccessful. And I think that was a real awakening for the people of Taiwan not to become overly dependent on mainland China. And that was a big, big catalyst and push for them to vote the way they did last Saturday. You know, that's very interesting. You know, um, we, we were talking about before, well, was the China factor the decisive element in the 9-1 election? Or was it the Sunflower Movement? Well, are the two exactly the same? Oh, but you can't. They're, they're, they're very, very, they're part of it. And in, in the chase of the China dream, China dream being uh, the economic, I think Ma was betraying some of Taiwan's own democracy by trying to get rid of Wong and steamroll this thing through the legislature, violating what Taiwan prides itself most on, and that is its democratic rule. And without the China threat and without the fear of dependence on China, you would never have had the Sunflower Movement. So yes, they're very much uh, one and the same. You know, that, that's a, an interesting point, that although Ma does feature himself as a very democratic person, um, he has certain reflexes that are eerily like the old Kuomintang, the old Nationalist Party. Um, and then another thing I think that just fueled it was what we've seen in Hong Kong. Now, I do not like comparisons between Hong Kong and Taiwan because they're very different animals. Mm -hmm. Even the most ardent, pro-democratic Anglophile in Hong Kong who loves the colonial era will say that Hong Kong is forever and ever part of China. But in Taiwan's case, it was home to Dutch settlements before it was first annexed by Fujian province in 1683. And the issue is not just the different political style between Taiwan and the mainland, it's also whether or not Taiwan is Chinese. So to compare Taiwan and Hong Kong is really like apples and oranges or kiwis and mandarins. Uh, but what, for those who are even flirting with the idea of applying Hong Kong's one, two, country, two systems formula to Taiwan, what they saw on their TVs the last few months was a definite turnoff. Mm. Seeing the way that Beijing and Hong Kong, their servants in Hong Kong, were so heavy-handed with students who just wanted the right to vote for their own leader, I think that was a definite turnoff for anybody on Taiwan who was ever thinking of some kind of peaceful coexistence within a greater China. Let's talk about another key personality in all of this, and that's Lian Zhan. Um, what's your take on Lian Zhan? I think he thinks he's Taiwan's ambassador to mainland China. And it just seems, you know, classic mainland China that they only want to talk to people who lose elections or who agree with them. Mm -hmm. And there he is, he loses in 2000 and loses in 2004 again. And now he's almost like living uh, full time in the mainland. And then his son loses a big election that he should have won in a KMT stronghold. Uh, I don't know what future he has, and I think he's really done his own party a great service. I, I, I would agree with you. I also think that, um, you know, he's one of the factors of why his son got, to, got, got, got so beaten in Taipei. His statements about Cole being a, this, it, how did he put it? Uh, he used the, 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 uh, the Chinese word, fundan, means bastard, right? Yeah, and accused his family of taking a Japanese surname during the colonial era. You know, that is a good warning to the KMT that they can't play these ethnically divisive games next year, and I think it shows that the DPP will be able to fight on the issues. Uh, these tricks aren't going to work. People aren't going to fall for that. I don't think that matters as much as it used to. It, it's, you know, it, that, that I thought was the very unfortunate side of this whole campaign. Is he opened those ethnic wounds, and which right. seemed to be, a, a lot of that has uh, simmered off and is fading into history, and especially when you talk to younger people in Taiwan. He, of course, is 78 years old, um, and, and he really reopened those. And I have to say that 
uh, Hao Long Bin's father, Hao Peishun, uh, he, I think he did Taiwan a disservice too because he was engaging in a lot of that same sort of rhetoric. And you know, it's the KMT who went to great lengths, starting with nominating Madame Chiang Kai-shek, handpicking Li Dong Wei to be president in the early 90s, went out of its way to Taiwanese itself, to right. make it less Chinese right. and more local. And then Li Dong Wei came out as a pro-Taiwan independence activist, you could say. I remember Ma very cleverly in 2008 was speaking all the local dialects, cycling around the entire island, and trying to make the KMT as localized as possible. Also picking, picking Vincent Shu as his vice presidential candidate, who is a native Taiwanese. Right. And then even the uh, animal, the mascot of the 2008 campaign was the blue Formosa magpie, which was a <laughs> native <laughs> to Taiwan, right. but blue. Right. So you can be blue in KMT, but still be Taiwanese. Right. So he had gone out of his way to try and make KMT more of a Taiwan-centric party, and with that one charge, that one comment, I feel Lian Zhang sent them back 20 years. Right. I, um, there's other allegations about Lian Zhang that I find disturbing. I, I'm not sure just how, uh, well, I think it's true that he's got a lot of financial interest in the mainland. He's got a lot of business interest. And um, his, his son's, uh, one of his son's campaign themes was, um, well, you know, uh, essentially, if I'm not elected uh, mayor of Taipei, then we're, we're, Taipei won't have this connection with China, and there will be no jobs, you know, there will be no job growth, um, which I think is pretty far-fetched. On the other hand, one has to remember that as part of the Lian uh, family, the Lian Gong, if you want to put it, uh, the, in the Lian clan, he also shares in those business interests in the mainland. Um, and there's also some other allegations I've heard that, um, that, that suggest that Nian John has passed on certain sensitive information to the mainland, uh, which I, I find to be disturbing, uh, yet it has, has yet to be fully proven. Yeah, I'm not going to, I haven't followed any of those allegations, you know, I've heard different things, I'm, I'm not really going to comment on that. I, I, I just take, I take Nian John at face value that he views China the way he does, and he sees Taiwan's future there for various reasons. And I think it's a problem with the KMT that they kind of become a one-trick pony, that they think any, the only avenue or the only outlet for Taiwan's future economic growth is greater integration with and or dependence on mainland China. And you do have to normalize relations with the mainland to participate in the world economic story. I realize that, but there's more to the world economy than just China. And that's been a problem with the KMT since Ma came to office, that they always want to think China, 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 and everything else takes a back seat. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the KMT is a little bit too beholden to big business interests. And those big interests, those big business interests really try to drive that China policy, Foxconn Corporation, for example. Um, and fairly or unfairly, that's in the minds of people that the KMT is in tight with big business. I think that's the view, and that's why things like the food oil scandal or the gas pipe explosion, those are things that, where who knows, the people in those companies may have been green or they may have voted green, but people just assume that big business is in cahoots with the KMT. So when there is any kind of business scandal, I think the KMT suffers for it in public mm, opinion. Mm, that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, and also another thing, you know, the KMT also tried playing, not really the, I think it was misconstrued, but they offended a lot of people in South Korea too in this campaign because they ran an ad in Taiwan that showed uh, cards later, or yeah, cards with the South Korean flag and then the Taiwan ROC flag. And as I heard it, I haven't seen it yet, but I've read it about it, that whenever you picked up uh, South Korean card, there was an ace underneath. And whenever you picked up the ROC Taiwan card, there was a queen underneath. And it was a lady in traditional Korean dress, a humbug, thanking the people of Taiwan for not ratifying more trade deals with mainland China so that Korea could advance at the expense of Taiwan. Yeah. And it is the traditional hostility and tension between Koreans and Taiwanese for a lot of issues we won't get into now. So South Koreans took it as they were playing the Korean ethnic card 
in uh, Taiwan politics. That's not the intention. The intention was to chastise ta fellow Taiwanese for not keeping pace with Korea's economy. But the point is that even off Taiwan in a nearby democracy and fellow U.S. out like Korea, the KMT was annoying people and losing whatever friends they may have. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and actually, it would be to Taiwan's benefit to have a better relationship with South Korea. And the relationship used to be extremely close. Of course, South Korea broke relations with Taiwan in the early 90s. Uh, in but, a very unceremonious way, I might add. Yeah, that's, that's exactly true. And, and, I, and I sense there's some feeling between the two countries that maybe they should be getting on a little bit better, but they, they're competitors in so many areas, and South Korea seems to be so interested in, in ramping up its relationship with China that it, um, I, I think, sometimes overlooks uh, Taiwan. They are competitors, and uh, they're very, you know, now China and South Korea are signing their own FTA. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, South Korea is, I think, just so is so blinded by its hatred of Japan. Uh, you know, I'm, I may not like Japan so much if I, if I were Korean, but it, it's, it's such a preoccupation for Koreans that they, I think they think anybody who is an enemy of Japan is their friend. And I think that's blinded in some, of, some of China's excesses and extremes. And, you know, Koreans should remember that without Taiwan, South Korea probably would have lost the Korean War. And, you know, Chiang Kai-shek had his own reasons to support us and the UN and the South Korean War, send troops there, offer amnesty and mm -hmm. asylum to any captured Chinese troops who didn't want to go back to the mainland. Right. But without the critical role, as MacArthur called Taiwan, the unthinkable aircraft carrying the Pacific, I would, you know, all of Korea would probably be under the Kim Dynasty right now. So Koreans should keep that in mind. Well, that's, that's a very good point. Well, let's get back to um, the, the, the selection. Um, okay. Uh, what does the DPP need to do to uh, continue to improve its fortunes? What does it need to do to take the presidency in 2016? The DPP has to make sure it doesn't step on its own feet here in the next 14 months, because really this is their election to lose. Mm -hmm. uh, as you were saying, so many of the KMT glitterati lost. The only one left is Eric Shu, and he only barely won a race that should have been a slam dunk. Right. And, uh, so it really is the game, uh, the DPPs for the taking. The DPPs traditional problem is they have so many rival factions. They have a party charter and platform that calls for de jure Taiwan independence. Is that they can never coherently articulate a China policy that doesn't alarm the middle of the Taiwan electorate. Listen, 95% of the people in Taiwan do not want to be part of China. But at the same time, they don't want a government they feel that is going to invite a conflict with China or isolation from the United States. If the DPP can craft and articulate a policy similar to Ma's in many ways, where he said no unification, no independence during my two terms in office, status quo. You know, people talk about the 92 consensus, which is pretty much... John, let me jump choice. in here. Let me jump in here. Yeah. We need to take another break here. And uh, we'll come back and uh, we'll continue to talk about this. Great. Our guest today is Mr. Sean King, joining us from New York City. Uh, he's Senior Vice President at uh, Parks, uh, Park Strategies. Uh, we're talking about uh, last weekend's 9-1 uh, election in Taiwan, which was a, a huge victory for the Democratic Progressive Party. Hi, my name is Sachiko Slomov. I'm the floor manager of Think Tech Hawaii here. Uh, you can join us on the air every weekday from 1 to 5 or off the air at thinktechhawaii.com. We stream all of our videos and all of our amazing, like, amazing shows ho, 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 at thinktechhawaii.com or on our Ustream channel. You can also check us out on Twitter at thinktechhi or Instagram at thinktechhi also. I'll be listening, and I hope to see you there. Thanks. Well, we're back on the air here. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, thank you for joining us today on uh, Think Tech Asia. Our guest today is Mr. Sean King, Senior Vice President of Park Strategies. Um, he has extensive knowledge about Asia. He's often uh, interviewed on various TV stations, often quoted in various leading uh, publications. Uh, we were talking, just before the break, we were talking about, well, what the DPP had a huge victory. 
Uh, now that the celebration is over, what do they have to do to continue this uh, uh, this this road of uh, additional victories, a uh, road to additional victories, and uh, mainly that would be winning the presidency in 2016. So, Sean, let's let's pick it up where we left off here, and uh, what what other advice would you have for the DPP? Really, the next you know time when she was the candidate in 2012, she'll almost certainly be in 2016. When she was asked about this 92 consensus issue in 2011, she didn't have a good answer. She's got to have an answer for that. She's got to have some kind of policy similar to Ma's, which says no unification, no independence, so long as I'm in office, status quo, let's focus on, you know, taking care of business, call it the 2016 consensus or whatever. It's going to be concise, reassuring, and I think with that, she wins, because the people of Taiwan are looking for a change. The middle of the electorate just has to be sure that uh, she won't provoke some kind of conflict with China and or isolation from the United States in the process. Well, okay, can I put it this way? Listening to what you're saying, this might be combining some of your thoughts with my own, is essentially what the DPP has to do is, uh, the, okay, as you say, address the 92 consensus, which for the benefit of our audience who might not be familiar with the 92 consensus, this is a, an agreement uh, hatched out between Taiwan and uh, China that essentially says there's one China. However, China, Taiwan has a sort of has created a lot of wiggle room for itself on that, and uh, they like to say one China with various interpretations. Eagle jungle go biao, as they say in Chinese. Um, the mainland. But, you know, is if I could point out, I, a lot of that 92 consensus was around the idea of whether it's ROC or PRC for all of China. Okay. It wasn't so much about Taiwan independence, it was competing views of what China is. And at the time, the government of Taiwan was not freely elected by its own people. Good point. Um, okay. So, um, as you said, this is an issue that she consistently ducked during the last election. And. Um, it made people uncomfortable. Um, as we go forward here, it seems to me essentially what she has to do, and I think you're suggesting this, but let's just double check this because it's an important point. She essentially has to uphold the status quo, okay? But if she gets elected, okay, she, she should not antagonize China. She, she should not annoy Washington. And she should essentially focus on the betterment of her supporters. And the betterment of all Taiwanese. You know, okay, once, betterment once of all Taiwanese. She's elected president, she represents all the people, yeah. Okay. So basically, what we say is, it's sort of the same situation as Ma in, in maintaining the status quo, but giving other folks that, um, how should I say, a better chance than maybe they feel they've received under the KMT, and, and reducing the dependence on China at least as much as possible. Yeah, she needs, she needs the same reassurance Ma had to give people, but she's coming at it from the other side. And uh, people were maybe worried in 08 that Ma was going to rush Taiwan toward unification with China. Mm -hmm. she, and people may worry that she's going to rush it toward formal independence. So just like Ma had to reassure people that it's status quo, she does, but she's coming at it from a different angle. She just needs to reassure Taiwanese in the middle. And because, uh, you know, 90% of the electorate, 90 to 95% of the electorate, Taiwan's already made its mind up. She needs those, those people in the middle and Washington. And how Washington reacts plays very big in Taiwan elections. Oh, for sure. Uh, because they know where they're guardian against China. And if we're uneasy about someone, they become uneasy. Right. And very symbiotic. So campaigning in D.C. for her is very important in terms of winning back home. Right. Uh, she just needs to reassure people she's a safe pair of hands. Mm. And I think uh, she's been through this once. She learned her lesson last time. She's smart, highly educated. Uh, I think she can do it, uh, but she, she's got her work cut out for her. Mm, boy, the next the, the, the next year or so leading up to the 2016 election is going to be really interesting. But you know something that, that occurs to me, and this I think was reflected very much in the last presidential election. The last presidential election, as you remember, was a, a was actually two elections rolled into one a presidential election plus a legislative election where they elected the parliament 2008 as well yeah yeah and and what i think what was really interesting about this was you had you know like certain areas of taiwan pingdong county for example on the very southern tip of taiwan 
They sent a large number of representatives to the legislature in Taipei. Okay, DPP members. But they voted for Ma. And they voted for Ma because of the China policy. They were benefiting from the, from the China policy. However, they were not happy with some of the social things that were going on in Taiwan, and they felt that that could best be, uh, their interest could best be achieved by voting for the DPP. So I'm wondering, if I think about that, I think, well, will there be a reflection of that in the 2016 election? In other words, people very demonstratively voted for the DPP in this election of a couple days ago. Okay, for what we might call domestic issues. But will they support the KMT in the national election for the China connection? Will yeah, they split their loyalties? The that, yeah, uh, it's interesting phenomenon. It's almost the way uh, people in the US, southern United States would vote Democrat for their members of Congress and Senate and then vote for Ronald Reagan in the White House. <laughs> but, you know, I don't want to compare my intro to Ronald Reagan. But I, I do think that, you know, the low-hanging fruit, and fruit was a big industry in the South, I think the low-hanging fruit of the China trade opening is gone. And I don't think people are going to be so quick to back the KMT this time. So I think uh, the DPP will be able to better motivate their own base in 2016. Mm. So, uh, you know, the 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 middle of the electorate is going to be crucial, but also I think more of the DPP base is going to come home for Taiwan or for whomever the candidate might be. And then in the South, it's really tough for KMT candidates to compete at the local level just because the DPP has such good institutional structure. Right, 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 right. It, it, it seems to that the candidates that the KMT pick up in the South are people who got annoyed with the DPP, left the DPP, and the KMT picked them up because they couldn't find anybody else. Right, they're disaffected green. So why would somebody, you know, who's green, vote for a light disaffected green when they can have a real green, the DPP? Right. So it's a, you know, it's really like the the B team. You know, another factor is the swing votes and I uh, swing voters, and I think that you, you know we saw some uh, some definitely in Taipei saw some swing voters, people that Taichung too, and Taichung as well. And, and people that supported the KMT in the past, but frankly, they were impressed by um, Mr. Ko, Dr. Ko's, shall we call it his narrative, his campaign, um, his campaign speeches, the fact that, you know, I'm humble. And he comes across as very humble and very self-effacing. And then, you know, and then you have, like, the Lien family, one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful political family in Taiwan. Makes That's the entitlement getting up and making these brash statements and they, they are actually, you know, quite living a life of opulence where uh, Ko is living a life of simplicity and that appealed to a lot of uh, KMT middle class people who swung over. Yeah, I think uh, if his honeymoon is still going and he does a good job the first year, his campaigning for and with Tsai Wen in the presidential race in 16 will help her immensely. That's an interesting point. I, and frankly, you mentioned something that, that has concerned me, is frankly, I'd like to see Ko do well as the mayor of Taipei, just from a personal perspective. But I wonder if he really has the administrative tools to do that, the administrative background. I mean, I like his talk about healing and bringing people together and transparency and a new era in governance and all that sort of thing. And I know that he ran a, in a very important part of a, the most important medical facility in Taiwan. But we're talking about a city of over two and a half million people. Where all the institutional bureaucracy tends to be KMT and blue. Right. Uh, a lot of people have an interest in seeing him fail. Right. I don't know. I can only hope, uh, you, know, for the, uh, you know, I love Taipei, the city too, but uh, I only hope that people rally. I, I think he's such a charismatic speaker that is still independent, again, not green. I do think he's going to cut across political boundaries and can be a tremendous campaign asset to when in 2016. Uh, we've talked about the South, we've talked about the North. I just want to talk a little bit about the middle, Taichung, sure. that's so important. Sure. You know, I often, politically, I think of Taiwan like Florida. Uh, you know, the North is blue, the South is green. Just like in Florida, the North tends to be Republican, the South Democrat, except for Cubans. And then in the middle, from Tampa to Orlando, that I-4 corridor, however those people voters usually have, 
state votes, and in some ways that's how a presidential election goes. Taichung is the I-4 corridor of Taiwan, and the fact that Jason Hill, a pretty popular guy, lost mm. mayor in Taichung, votes very badly for Taiwan, because usually Taiwan national elections go the way that Taichung goes. That's so an interesting it's really point. falling apart at all levels for the KMT. You know, I, I, I read some commentary about this the other day that I thought was pretty interesting. Okay, Taichung and Taichung County were rolled into one a few years ago. Right. Okay, when it was just Taichung City, he had no problem. But when they got rolled into Taichung County, that's where he began to encounter problems because a lot of voters, according to this one perspective, was he tended to favor the urbanites, the people who lived in Taichung proper. And he didn't pay much attention to the people who lived in Taichung County. They voted against him, and that's why he's out of um, out of the job. Yeah, um, too bad. You know, maybe maybe he'll try and be a presidential candidate in 2016. Who knows? Because he come, you know, he comes from a very influential part of the island. Okay, we're down to our last minute here. I, I would just like to say uh, something about the TPP. Um, I, I personally feel that uh, would like to see Taiwan in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, I think it would help to reduce uh, Taiwan's dependence on China. I also think it would be good for U.S.-Taiwan relations, uh, which in my view could use a little ramping up. Uh, however, on the other hand, I do think that Taiwan is maybe not quite ready for it yet. It needs to open more parts of its market. Perhaps the first step is a uh, bilateral investment uh, agreement. Well, we're down here to 30 seconds. Anything that you'd like to say in just a, a I think we're down to 25 now. <laughs> Anything that I, don't like think, to, any I, don't like I don't think Taiwan's ready for TPP just now, especially not under its current management. But uh, were it to become less China-focused and say a second round or expansion of TPP, just the way the EU or NATO would expand, I think it would be a prime candidate at that time. Great. And whoever wins the next election, I just want to congratulate people of Taiwan against great odds and another expression of a uh, fine democracy. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm your host, Bill Sharp, on Think Tech Asia. Our guest today has been uh, Mr. Sean King. He is Senior Vice President of Park Strategies, based in New York City. We also have an office in Taipei. Uh, and so we'd really like to thank him for joining us today and sharing his views with us. Uh, goodbye for now, and we'll see you next week.